Did you ever read the driver's manual? I mean... It was so long ago. I, I don't even know what I had for breakfast. Do you feel so bad that you want to help her pay for it? <laughs> Not that bad. Not that bad. Okay. Hi, Frank Caprio. Judge Caprio is known as one of the nicest and most empathetic judges on television. He's always charmed us with his benevolent approach to dispensing justice. However, even the most patient souls have their breaking points. Here are the 10 times Judge Caprio lost it on Caught in Providence. Number 1. Miss Guerrero Judge Caprio opened the court session by greeting everyone with a warm good morning. His optimistic demeanor, however, was met with a somewhat unwelcome surprise. Despite speaking English fluently, the defendant, a young woman called Miss Guerrero, sought an interpreter. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Can I have an interpreter? Despite being mildly taken aback by this request, Judge Caprio agreed to satisfy her. The lawsuit was centered on two red light violations. On February the 29th of 2016, summons number 993 would be issued at the junction of Pleasant Valley Parkway and Valley Street. Judge Caprio revealed the photographic evidence which plainly shows that Miss Guerrero's car ran a red light, and that evidence was unmistakable. Moving on to summons number 768, which occurred on Branch Avenue, it was clear that Miss Guerrero had again driven through a red light. The evidence was obvious, and Judge Caprio then turned to Miss Guerrero and informed her that she had received a parking ticket on George Street. He did, however, decide to reject this specific ticket, he then asked Ms. Guerrero if she had anything to say about the red light infractions, giving her the opportunity to speak out. She then allegedly, through an interpreter, said that her boyfriend was responsible for the offense on Branch Avenue. She said it was her boyfriend and she said she paid. He paid. She said that he had sent money by mail the day before. In answer, Judge Caprio inquired about the payment for the other infractions, wondering if her partner had also paid for them. Ms. Guerrero appeared uncertain, which caused uncertainty in the courtroom. Judge Caprio reached his judgment at that moment, declaring that she would be fined $85 for one of the infractions. For the red light violation on Branch Avenue perpetrated by her partner, he opted to keep the case open, expressing skepticism over receiving the cash. Ms. Guerrero then asked for a lower fine because she was presently unemployed. The judge was not amused by her entitled and rude demeanor, because he could see her scorn and feel the lack of gratitude in her actions. Given her demeanor, he then declared unequivocally that he would be unable to grant her a plea for a lower fine. Judge Caprio then said that he could tell by the look on her face that she had a poor attitude in the court. Number 2. David Norton David Norton found himself in a difficult predicament when he stood before Judge Caprio, who wasted no time getting to the bottom of the problem. Mr. Norton's car had been towed as the result of earlier parking offenses, and he had previously received 29 parking citations. Mr. Norton was reminded of the prior judgment, in which he had paid $300 to have the boot on his car removed. He had also promised to pay $100 every month toward the outstanding sum of $1,090. Mr. Norton, however, had failed to honor his pledge and had not paid a single penny toward the outstanding sum. To make matters even worse, he had altered his vehicle's registration to avoid being caught and thought that by doing this, he would be able to avoid the repercussions of his conduct. Unknown to him, his cunning act had backfired and he now faced eight fresh unpaid parking citations. When given the opportunity to explain himself, Mr. Norton stated that his inability to pay was due to a recent unemployment. However, Judge Caprio promptly pointed out that his change in registration had taken place prior to him being unemployed, rendering that argument ineffective. Mr. Norton, the judge emphasized, had exhibited utter disdain for the court's authority. His activities were beginning to have an adverse impact, and his car had been towed, which resulted in daily storage fees and an extra boot fee. Mr. Norton was, of course, concerned about the rising interest and daily fees, and questioned if anything could be done about it, the judge then indicated that he could, but the real question was whether he would. Mr. Norton's lack of effort and contempt for the court had worn very thin, according to the judge. The court agreed to take $500 from Mr. Norton in order to release the automobile from the towing firm. When discussing a payment plan for the remaining sum, however, the judge decreased Mr. Norton's suggested $75 monthly payment to $50, emphasizing the need for a quick payment. Nonetheless, the judge handed Mr. Norton a severe warning 
If he did not follow the deal or return to court with new infractions, every previous waived fine would be reapplied. Number 3. Mr. Holden As the morning session began, the courtroom was full of anticipation. Judge Caprio took to his position behind the bench, noted for his fair and cool demeanor. Mr. Holden was represented by Jerome Losco Jr., a counselor from Thrive Behavioral Health, in the first case on the docket. Jerome had presented himself and explained his job as Mr. Holden's counselor to the court. He'd brought a letter to the court about a parking penalty that Mr. Holden had received on Fulton Street. Judge Caprio then asked if Jerome had been there for Mr. Holden's earlier court appearance, to which he answered that a different counselor had been present. While inquiring about this, the judge spoke with Mr. Holden. Mr. Holden had a disability parking badge, but he had parked in a prohibited location. The judge stated that the placard permitted parking in overtime zones or designated disabled spaces only if it was legally lawful. Mr. Holden intervened vehemently claiming that he gets a yearly ticket on Martin Luther King Day. He ascribed this tendency to strong convictions and equal rights and saw himself as a defender of truth and justice. Judge Caprio, who was taken aback, speculated that Mr. Holden's parking practices could have played a factor in his repeated tickets. Mr. Holden unyieldingly argued that his principles were the cause of unlawful targeting that he thought he was facing. He charged that the courtroom was full of falsehoods and expressed his dissatisfaction with the system. Mr. Holden was adamant about telling the truth and would not back down. In reaction, Judge Caprio would tell the real truth, recalling Mr. Holden's prior appearances when the court had dropped his ticket as a show of mercy. Mr. Holden, on the other hand, allegedly turned back and aggressively waved at the judge as he exited the courthouse. As the tension between the two had grown, the courtroom lapsed into an unsettling silence. Judge Caprio asked him to apologize, to which he replied, I didn't do anything like that. The judge was so upset that he sent the matter down for trial, as Mr. Holden vehemently denied the accusations, declaring them to be a lie. Number 4. Bertha in this clip, Judge Caprio would be caught having a heated argument with a woman named Bertha. Bertha had a nasty attitude when they were negotiating two tickets, expressing impatience and contemptuous demeanor towards the judge. The mood became more tense as the judge sought to explain the ticket specifics, but Bertha stopped him with her own version of the events. She said that one ticket was for June 3rd on Current Street, and the other was July 21st on Darwin Street. She asserted, however, that she received a citation when parking on Darren Street in downtown Providence. The judge pressed on Bertha, asking if anyone else besides her had driven the car. She admitted that she didn't know, mentioning something about encountering heavy traffic. The judge then tried to establish whether she remembered being on Darren Street during a demonstration, and she replied affirmatively, citing the courthouse in the area. The judge, sensing Bertha's growing annoyance, inquired whether she intended to dispute the tickets, she then denied any intentions of doing so, implying that the tickets had actually been stolen. Despite her irritability, the judge stayed calm and guided her to the cashier, notifying her of a $40 cost. The judge took a tough stand before letting her go, pointing out her terrible attitude. He emphasized that he had really assisted her by lowering the initial ticket pricing from $30 to $20 and charging her only $40 instead of $150 in total which saved her a significant amount of money. He was disappointed by her reply, recalling her raised eyebrows and filthy expression. The judge then called her back and pointed at her bad attitude by saying, you have a bad attitude, don't give me an attitude. Bertha, seeing her error, issued a half-hearted apology, admitting her misbehaviors. The judge then consulted her to adjust her attitude, emphasizing the significance of respect. She also apologized for raising her eyebrows, understanding that it was an unneeded statement. The tension continued because Bertha was plainly upset and grappling with her emotions. The judge's empathy would surface when he realized that she was going through a difficult time. He informed her that he was not working right now, meaning that his statements were not intended to damage her. The judge then provided a solution, recommending a payment schedule that would work with Bertha's financial situation. He explained that she could make smaller payments over time, paying just what she could afford. Number 5. Mr. Powell A man by the name of Mr. Powell arrived in Judge Caprio's courtroom in a stunning case. He made a horrible first impression by rambling about unrelated things, 
and Judge Caprio ordered him to halt and listen to him for one minute. The judge said, I want you to concentrate for one minute, okay? You've been charged with a misdemeanor. Despite Judge Caprio's warnings, the man continued to chat about unrelated topics, saying, take a look, a dream, and I don't know if what I dream is right and what I dream is right, but it just makes sense. Just like if you have peanut butter and jelly, you add some bread, and you get a knife. Is it good? It makes common sense to me. He proceeded for more than a minute until things then took a very dark turn and he began to have a full-on tantrum over his accusations and began to tell how he had been fighting for years of his life due to discrimination. I want to know why I have to be discriminated against because of the way I look. Now, I believe in the Bible. That's the law, which is an oath. That's a precedent. That's everything that is followed by the United States, and I don't know why. He was facing some serious charges when he went to a 7-Eleven and began wreaking havoc. He started ranting at customers, staff, and others, refusing to leave the store when told to do so. The court had questioned him about the event, stating, You weren't making any purchases, and you were yelling at customers and staff. You were advised to leave because of your behavior, but you refused. He would quickly dispute those claims, explaining calmly that everything was a fabrication. He said he did no damage, and merely went to the 7-Eleven to preach about Jesus Christ. He then went on to say, It's a lie, a total lie. I was in 7-Eleven talking about God, smiling, laughing, and believing in what I want to believe in, because that is what my country believes in. It says it on my dollar bill. He continued to ramble on and on, and again, reiterated his innocence and said that falsehoods had been spread about him. At this point, Judge Caprio lost it and went off on the individual, making a fiery statement, what I want to know is whether you pled guilty or not guilty. All right, the man is going to be set down for trial. What that means is that I'm releasing you on the following conditions. First, you will be back here on April the 2nd for a trial. Do you understand that? Second, you'll have to keep the peace and be of good behavior between now and April 2nd. Number 6. Double Jeopardy A man stood before the judge and the mood in the courtroom was strained. Their sour disposition was visible, as seen by the dismissive and belligerent demeanor. The man appeared to be bored and rebellious, speaking carelessly and disrespectfully to the judge. As he addressed the individual, the judge attempted to keep the order. He firmly admonished the man to respect him by using suitable language and etiquette. However, the individual maintained his casual demeanor, appearing unmoved by the judge's statements. The person's behavior worsened as the proceedings would progress, talking about double jeopardy at least 17 times and criticizing the judge's rulings and rejecting his authority. The courtroom was tense as the person's rebellious demeanor collided with the judge's efforts to preserve the order. And during the heated debate, the person's demeanor darkened. He made veiled threats indicating his desire for the judge to be harmed. When he's finished with you, you'll regret that you hadn't done that, he warned. The judge then took these threats seriously because he recognized the gravity of the issue. He told the sergeant about the threats made against him, and the person remained arrogant, saying that whatever you want to do, do it. I've got lawyers, your honor. He was trying to challenge Judge Caprio, and was then taken away as he began to curse in the courtroom. Despite the seriousness of the situation, the individual refused to repent. They proceeded to question the judge's authority, stating that their prior record had nothing to do with the current case. The individual's history and aliases were discussed, showing a problematic past, and he said that he would sue the judge. He was brought before the court again, but the judge maintained his cool, carefully analyzing the individual's actions and remarks. He stated that the contempt of court allegation could be addressed during the current session, but that the accusation of threatening a public officer had to be dealt with separately in a different court. As the hearings would conclude, the man apologized to the judge. His contempt of court charge was dismissed, and he was awarded credit for time previously spent. The man was then remanded to the adult correctional institution on the charges of intimidating a public authority. The person's nasty attitude and belligerent behavior were evident throughout the entire encounter, and his rude and contemptuous attitude towards the judge generated a heated and combative atmosphere in the courtroom. Number 7. Maria Lopez Maria Lopez Carr found herself in front of Judge Caprio, an unusual sight as her demeanor and attitude rapidly enraged the judge. Her earlier appearance in the court about her vehicle's registration, which had been booted owing to outstanding penalties, was remembered by the judge, and her casual comments about her son handling the situation would irritate him even more. Maria's son had notified her that $140 was due, 
in order to remove the boot, with $100 still being owed after three years. This information would surprise Maria, who had delegated the responsibility for managing the problem to her son. When the court asked who had driven the automobile, she replied that her child did it frequently without her knowledge. The judge was irritated by her son's behavior, stating that he was 24 years old and yet was up to no good. Her answer to the judge's query concerning her son's capacity to pay the fine would further aggravate him. She gently indicated that her son might be able to help, but then redirected the discussion, concentrating on her own readiness to pay. Judge Caprio became irritated, stating, You give me the, oh my son, you know my son will go. He's off duty. The car's in your name. Give him some responsibility. The court attempted to counsel her, emphasizing the need to hold her son accountable for his conduct. He was aware of the complexity of parent-child relationships, but reassured Maria that this was a private problem that was not connected to her or his aspirations to assist her. The judge intended to provide pleasant advice and assistance while understanding the difficulty of parenting. Judge Caprio stated his hopes that Maria's circumstances would improve and that she would find reasons to smile in an attempt to inject some sympathy into the situation. He admitted that he might have come across as being harsh at first, but emphasized his objectives were simply to help her out. She was then given a $210 charge, and the judge recognized family dynamics, acknowledging that each event had its own unique tale. Judge Caprio also made an effort to bridge the gap by wishing Maria well and expressing his desires for her son to join her in being accountable. He praised her for being a good mother and urged her to keep on working for a brighter future. Despite the difficult beginnings, Maria exited the courtroom appreciative of the judge's goodwill and hopeful for better times to come. Number 8. Mr. Panera The relationship between Judge Caprio and Frank Panera quickly deteriorated in his presence. They had a less-than-nice encounter to begin their conversation. Judge Caprio had met Mr. Panera, who was accused of disobeying a request to leave a pub as the court session got underway. But the judge's criticism was rapidly aroused by Mr. Panera's behavior. Judge Caprio addressed Mr. Panera's actions inside the Alley Cat pub as the proceedings got off to a tense beginning. Mr. Panera was the one who had refused to leave, according to the barman. Mr. Panera reacted angrily to the instructions to leave by using foul language, making obscene gestures and refusing to go. When Mr. Panera placed a chair on the pavement and blocked pedestrian traffic, his disobedience then increased. Police officers reportedly approached him and told him that he would be arrested and sent to jail if he went back into the pub. Now, Mr. Panera nodded in agreement as he walked away, but it did not take him long to resurface and disobey the police's orders. This time, he steadfastly refused to leave the area and sat down at a table that was already full of other customers. Mr. Panera seemed more sorry and repentant during his plea before the station. He acknowledged his own stupidity by saying, I drink and I get stupid. That is precisely what took place. I apologize, Judge Caprio, though took a while to forget and forgive. Caprio recognized Mr. Panera's admission, but also emphasized the inconvenience that was caused by typical actions taken by people who are intoxicated. The judge explored the idea that drinking alcohol frequently causes people to create a false sense of power and invincibility. He pled with Mr. Panera to understand his frailty and the fallout of his actions. Despite his expressions of regret and remorse, the judge requested Inspector Quinn's advice. After taking into account Mr. Panera's contrition and compliance, the inspector suggested a $50 fine. The court decided to impose the suggested fine because he was inclined to agree with the inspector's advice. He gave Mr. Panera the assurance that he would have plenty of time to pay the fine, but Mr. Panera's demeanor throughout the hearings allowed for some wiggle room and indulgence. While it was obvious that the judge had taken notice of his actions and inquired into them, the judge's decision to penalize Mr. Panera represented a severe warning against his future behavior. Number 9. Mom and Son A mother and son were in front of Judge Caprio, in beginning the proceedings, the judge realized that the mother, who could not speak English, needed an interpreter. After acknowledging the interpreter's presence, the judge then began by requesting their names. It would soon become apparent that the boy would be speaking for his mother. The family's use of three distinct registration places for their automobiles became clear as the case would develop. The judge understood the ramifications of the circumstances right away, demonstrating a pattern of amassing unpaid fines 
and then altering registrations to avoid being discovered. This hunch was verified by Inspector Quinn, who noted that it was a typical strategy employed by certain people to avoid having to pay penalty. The mother explained that the three cars belonged to herself, her late husband, and her son. However, all of them were registered under her name. The total amounts to be paid were $400 due to the $300 in penalties from the individual tickets plus $100 boot charge. The mother would be informed by the translator that the initial fine total was $1,115 as per Judge Frank's instructions. He decided to lower the punishment after observing her readiness to pay and addressing the situation. He made it clear, though, that he would not decrease it any further. The mother indicated comprehension after hearing the message from the interpreter, and when the son's actions came into focus, the discussion then changed. It was found that he had been receiving multiple fines while commuting to university in one of the registered automobiles. The judge expressed sympathy for the mother, but emphasized the necessity of her taking steps to make things right. He advised her to either take her son's keys away and force him to use public transport, or to encourage him to get a job and assume financial responsibility for the penalties himself. But the mother and the boy were reminded by the judge that life itself is a mirror of the court, and that decisions do have consequences. He said that she had better straighten her son out, and also emphasized the significance of both action and inactivity as he concluded his remarks. He also said that taking no action might be equally as harmful as making bad decisions. In order to help her son to grow into a responsible adult, a mother's love for him should be matched with a strong hand. Number 10. Tribal Trust A man stood defiantly, seemingly unconcerned with the judicial proceedings. The court informed him that his case would be forwarded to the city solicitor and that a trial date would be set. The individual appeared unconcerned, swiping through his phone and making a poor attempt to hide it, displaying a disregard for the judicial etiquette. As the case would go on, it became evident that the man had gotten a red light infraction. When ordered to take his hands out of his pockets, he made a contemptuous comment, expressing his disregard for the court. Evidence tying him to the infraction on Pleasant Valley Parkway and Valley Street was then provided, and the man moved for his ticket to be thrown out, saying that the local tribe's trust that he belonged to had unique status and authority. He claimed that his infraction should be ignored because the local code did not apply to the trust. The judge, on the other hand, refused both his petition to dismiss and his appeal, emphasizing that the tribe trust did not insulate its members from municipal law. Undaunted, the guy persevered, presenting more documents and evidence in an attempt to influence the court's judgment. He believed that any commercial disputes affecting the tribal trust were subject to federal or tribal jurisdiction. However, Judge Caprio stood firm on his decisions, dismissing the man's allegations and confirming the local ordinance's legality. The judge cynically noted that the case's possible escalation in response to the man's insistence, observing that he was dissatisfied with the decision he might file appeals in numerous jurisdictions, from the District Court to the Supreme Court of Rhode Island, and even on to the Federal Court. The judge's comments highlighted the man's excessive efforts to avoid an $85 ticket, further emphasizing his confrontational and stubborn attitude. The hearing remained heated as the man adhered to his arguments, stating his readiness to go to considerable lengths to avoid the repercussions of the infraction. The judge then closed the conversation by recognizing the man's objectives and encouraging him to take the required measures to continue his appeal. The judge said, and if you're dissatisfied with that, then you go to the federal district court for federal jurisdiction. Then we have the Second Circuit Appellate Court of the United States, and then after that, maybe you could take a ride to Washington. The man's behavior and continuous search for legal loopholes demonstrated a lack of respect for authority, as well as contempt for the court's time and resources. What did you think of these 10 times that Judge Caprio lost it on Caught in Providence? Let me know all about it in the comments down below, and I'll see you next time.